Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Council's Geoeconomic Center and South Asia Center's event, lunchtime headline event on revitalizing the World Trade Organization. It's a very crucial time to be talking about this. Um, the organization has ruled that the Trump administration's tariffs on China uh, conflict with WTO rules. They have just uh, granted the European Commission entitlement to $4 billion in settlement against Boeing. This comes on the, head, on the tails of a $7.5 billion allotment to Airbus just shortly a while ago. Um, and we're about to get a new director general. So this is, the, we have a lot on our plate today. And I couldn't be more uh, happy to welcome a very distinguished panel of uh, guests today. We have Ignacio Garcia Bercero, the director at the Director General of Her Trade at the European Commission. Sumaya Keynes, the trade and globalization editor of The Economist based here in Washington. Mark Linscott, senior advisor at the Asia Group, and he's also a non-resident senior fellow with us. Atlanta Council, and Cleet Willems, who is also a fellow, uh, but partner at Aiken Gump. We're going to headline this event by asking Cleet to give us an overview introduction based on a really substantive paper that he's just published with us today. Uh, we'll put this in the chat, we'll, we'll discuss it today, but please take some time uh, to read it and give it a very thorough read afterwards. Because this is lunch and it's also Friday, uh, we're going to have a bit of a free conversation here, no formal panel. So we'll ask our um, Cleet to go and our panelists to give an initial response, but then we'll go for a free flowing conversation. So please drop all of your questions in the, in the uh, sidebar over there and we'll bring you in as it seems appropriate. So without further ado, over to you Cleet. Thank you very much, Julia, and to the Atlantic Council and, and everyone for, for joining today. I also at the outset want to make sure to give a special thank you uh, to Chuck Levy with Cassidy Levy Kent and Steve Coe, one of my partners at Aiken Gump, for all of their very important contributions to this paper. It wouldn't have happened without them. Um, so what, what do I want to do today? And, and instead of going through all the details of the, of the paper in my introduction, what I'd like to do instead is hopefully we can, we can get to that in the questions. But what I'd like to do instead is really explain why we're doing this paper, uh, what we hope to achieve out of it, and why we're doing it now. Why is it timely? Um, first, in terms of what we're trying to achieve, there really are three objectives here. And the first one is to raise the level of ambition. And I've been very encouraged, as I'm sure many of you have, about the numerous conversations that are going on about WTO reform. That's fantastic. But I think as I've been viewing those conversations, it does seem that we're still nibbling at the edges a bit, thinking about how do we restore the status quo perhaps uh, from a couple of years ago, instead of really thinking about taking a step back and saying, how do we create a system that's fit for purpose in the 21st century and solves or tries to solve all the problems that we're facing in the international trade space? And so that's the idea here is to really encourage that kind of big thinking um, about what we are trying to achieve. Now, I think to get there, you need to first be very realistic about the shortcomings in the system. And I will be the first to say, I think the WTO has been a huge success for the United States and Europe. It's helped us solve problems over time, but it's also falling short in some very substantial ways across the board. And if you look at the negotiations and you're realistic and you say, you know, we've really only had one major substantive multilateral agreement in the last 25 years. We don't cover some of the most timely issues, whether it's things like some of the practices coming out of China, whether it's uh, you know, things like environment and labor that have become increasingly important in the political debate, or whether it's things like digital services and the economy. And so the idea here is to put some things on the table to really spark the imagination to think big and to have a higher level of ambition some of this stuff's gonna be pretty controversial. I'll, I'll, I'll grant that, but I think we need to be willing to tackle those kinds of things if we're gonna get, um, get to get this done. And, and, and you know, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of that, I mean, some of the things that I throw on the table here are um, looking at, you know, in the negotiating space, we've had a lot of trouble reaching consensus. So how do we get more political involvement? Should we consider things like having plurilateral agreements on a non, most favored nation basis where there isn't free riding and only those who make the commitments end up being the beneficiary of that. 
I look at things like restructuring the secretariat or possibly getting rid of uh, Article 21.5 arbitrations uh, and rethinking the way that the appellate body operates within the system. Um, looking at the issue, I think we need to talk about the issue of developing country status in a real way to make sure that the least developed countries continue to benefit, but some of the countries who have graduated um, in, a, in any meaningful sense of the term are treated the same as we are in the United States and Europe. And of course, I think we need to be realistic and say, it's not gonna work politically anymore for the United States and China to have a different level of commitments at the WTO. The second thing that we really try to do here is, is uh, look at this in a comprehensive way. I think there've been some great reform proposals focused on dispute settlements. Uh, and the United States, of course, is really focused on the negotiating front and, and figuring out what it can do there. Um, but no one has really brought that all together and put it in one place where we can look at all this stuff and, and think about all the different things and the, the scope of reform that's necessary across the board. And I think that's important both to just understand the task ahead of us, but also because there are really important linkages between the different pillars of the WTO. And just to give you one example on that, if you look at dispute settlement and you look at the problems with dispute settlement, and you know there are, there are many, um, one of the problems with dispute settlement and one of the reasons many of us believe that the adjudicators have gone beyond their mandate and have been forced to fill in gaps over time is because the negotiations haven't updated the agreements. And so you have this scenario where the world is changing, but we don't have updated negotiated text. And then you have this interest to get it right in the modern world and you have the adjudicators and the appellate body filling in those gaps. So unless you fix negotiations, you don't ever really fix dispute settlement. You don't fix the core problem. And in the same way, I would argue that if you don't fix dispute settlement, you're gonna to continue to have a chill on negotiations. Because the problem we have today, again, is when the adjudicators are looking to fill in gaps that the negotiators didn't fill in themselves, you limit the flexibility and constructive ambiguity in different kinds of tools that we can use to get to yes on negotiations. So if you don't fix dispute settlement, you don't fix negotiations. And there's a whole lot of linkages like that that we try to explore. And then the third thing here that we're really trying to achieve is to promote consensus with the United States and Europe. And obviously we aren't the only two players in the multilateral system, and we're gonna to need to come to terms with China and India and everyone else. But my view is if you know two entities like this who created the system together, who share a common heritage, who have both benefited from the system, if we cannot get on the same page, we are sunk. And so what I try to do here is I try to come up with something that maybe in Europe, they like 70, 80% of it. Maybe over in the Winder building at USTR, they like 70 or 80% of it. But we try to find that commonality. We try to show flexibility. And we realize at the end of the day that there's actually a lot that we share together. And can we get on the same page in the US and the EU? Can we stop focusing on these longstanding disputes like Airbus and Boeing? Can we stop focusing on those kinds of things and focus on how we work together to solve the problems? And like I said, it's not just the US and the EU who are gonna to have to do this over the long run, but that is an important place to start and maybe a building block to then how we can engage with the rest of the world. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on why we're, we're doing this now and why it's important. And I think there's two reasons there. Uh, the first is you may have heard that there's a presidential election in the United States. Um, maybe that's going to be going on in a couple weeks here. And what I really wanted to do is help set the stage for either a second term Trump administration, you know, who is more likely to focus on the WTO even more than they have in the first term, or for a Biden administration to think about what's possible and what they could achieve at the WTO. And I think at this point, it's really important to, to, to remember how bipartisan these concerns really are. And I always like to remind people who sort of look at the appellate body issue as a Trump issue, that actually it was under Obama that the United States first moved to start blocking the reappointment of appellate body members and trying to force this issue. So we, this is gonna be a bipartisan issue for us in the United States. And I hope that no matter what happens in November, we do have a chance to refocus on the WTO and work together. Because at the end of the day, as we talk in the United States, a lot of the conversation on trade is about China,
But my view is that the only way that we're ever going to effectively deal with the problems China poses is if we do so multilaterally. You know, we can do our phase one deal, and I think that was great. I was a part of that. But that needs to be complemented with a multilateral solution. Uh, and, and, and that's why I'm doing that now. And then the last point is just, you know, if you haven't heard of the presidential uh, election, you might have heard about this election for the director general over in Geneva. And whoever wins that, you know, she is going to have a very tall task ahead of her in, in trying to really push members to think big. And I hope that this can be seen as a contribution to that and can help influence um, whatever happens um, in Geneva. So I'll stop there and, and thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to, to speak to all of you, to put this paper out, and, and we can get into some more of the specifics in, um, in the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Cleet, for that great introduction. Um, who wants to go first? Maybe, um, maybe Ignacio, um, you know, the core, core, core tenant here is US and the EU together. Give us your first initial impressions. Okay, and actually let me start by saying uh, that it's a great pleasure to talk here in the Atlantic uh, Council and I have greatly enjoyed uh, the paper uh, written by Cleet. Before I came back to Brussels to my current uh, position, I spent one year in Oxford doing research and I was also writing a paper on WTO reform and Cleet gave me some very useful insights. Let me start by saying that I totally agree with Cleet uh, that WTO reform is only going to happen if the United States and the European Union get their act together. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, it's just simply going to happen because we agree. It is a multilateral organization. A lot of things need to be done in order to get things moving. But in the absence of transatlantic convergence, WTO reform would not happen. And the WTO is actually in a deep crisis and badly needs reform. The second point which I wanted to make is that if you want to succeed in achieving WTO reform, you need to be able to combine the ambition and pragmatism. You need to be able to fix priorities. And I would like to give you quickly my sense about what the priorities are. But certainly, I would also say you need to combine a comprehensive approach. You need to look into all aspects of the organization, but you also need to work on the basis of sequencing. Not everything can happen at the same time, and otherwise you will get again into the problems of a single undertaking. So what are the priorities? What are the issues in which the United States and the European Union should try to concentrate if they want to work together to, on WTO reform? First, the WTO absolutely needs to restore credibility as a negotiating forum. It is essential to identify a number of areas where it is possible to achieve success when it comes to the negotiating function of the WTO. And there, from my point of view, you have uh, basically some issues that relate to sustainability. There's fishery subsidies negotiations, which have been going for too long. But there are also new initiatives which have been discussed in the WTO about how to deal, respond to the current pandemic, a trade and health initiative. And we have announced that we would want to work also with partners on the trade and climate initiative. So you need to identify a few areas like that where it is possible to achieve success in the WTO as a negotiating forum. And there is, of course, the very important negotiations on e-commerce, which are extremely important from the economic point of view, but which are also a very important testing uh, ground for this idea which has been presented by CLEAT how to integrate a plurilateral agreement into the WTO system. Free riders. Now, exactly how to do that is not easy, and that's something which I'm sure uh, we would need to have intensive discussions between the United States and the European Union. The second uh, big area where we should concentrate uh, is WTO dispute settlement. I will not go into details on that because I hope there are going to be several uh, interactions, but I'm deeply convinced that it is possible for the United States and the European Union to get much closer together on WTO dispute settlement, provided that it's very clear that we retain two core elements of the system, is binding nature and an independent appellate function. Everything else, I think, should be up to discussion. I don't agree with everything which is in this paper, 
I agree with quite a few things which are in this paper, but my uh, key message is that it should be possible for the United States and the European Union to discuss seriously how to reform the WTO dispute settlement system, preserving its binding nature and preserving an independent appellate body. And the third big thing is, of course, China. The big issue is how are you going to, to try to, to move forward in the WTO on the issues which are critical in terms of how to handle the, uh, China, the issues which are necessary to ensure a level playing field, industrial subsidies, state-owned enterprises, uh, forced technology transfer. I totally agree with uh, Keith when he says that those issues which are very difficult, which are very deep, uh, are not going to be solved bilaterally. They can solve, hopefully, in a broader uh, setting, but this is going to require a real effort to create a coalition of countries which is interested in moving forward in this uh, direction, working together to, to indicate what are the type of rules which need to be developed in the WTO. I think that this is something on which the United States has been working with the European Union and Japan, but we would need a much broader coalition if we really want to put the pressure on China to, to move. So I would say these are the areas which I would seek that have been the, the priorities, and I would totally agree that if there's one thing on which the United States and the European Union should concentrate on trade, is to try to see how we can cooperate on WTO reform. Thanks, Ignacio. Um, so Maya, maybe I can turn to you. Um, yeah. to, you're, you're not an active trade negotiator or recently haven't been one, so please. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can bring uh, bring the non trade negotiated perspective. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, first of all, um, and second of all, um, well, thanks to Cleet for writing this paper. Um, I agreed with with um, with quite a few things in it, um, as well as Ignacio. Um, the you know the judicial function problems being linked to the negotiating functions. Um, one one story I heard was that when the negotiators were agreeing the um, trade remedies rules. They perhaps weren't entirely aware of the teeth um, in the dispute settlement function that was being negotiated, you know, a few doors down. Um, and so, you know, one concern now, well, you yeah, know, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone who was there will insist that they knew exactly what was going on in every single room of this negotiation. Um, but, you know, obviously one, one concern is that, you know, as soon as the as soon as the, as the rules start to have teeth, um, it becomes much harder to to agree them, right? And you kind of mentioned constructive ambiguity um, as something that was necessary to get an, a negotiation over the line. Um, I'm I'm no lawyer, um, not, neither lawyer nor a negotiator. Um, I guess you know having binding rules and and constructive. Uh, ambiguity, what was left constructively ambiguous is obviously in the eye of the beholder. Um, and so um, it's, it, it, I guess the point is it could be, it could be just sort of a philosophical challenge um, of how to set up a system that could both give you the room to maneuver that you think you've negotiated, but also have independent lawyers who are assessing whether or not you've broken the rules. It's obviously, you'll always say that, well, of course, I'm, I haven't broken the rules, right? Um, uh, I also agree that the Airbus Boeing dispute was a complete waste of time and it would be good if um, the EU and the US could, um, you know, act a bit more constructively towards each other. You do clearly need political engagement. If the US and the EU can't agree on things, then, you know, kind of game over. Um, now, that said, I, I suppose I also feel very cynical um, about everything um, for which for which I apologise. Um, but, you know, historically, the WTO has been um, it's often been a way to bake in commitments that you know the governments have kind of already decided that they want to do um, or want to make. Um, so you know, with with tariff negotiations, often um, often essentially you know company com companies countries had already lowered their tariff limits. Sorry, their, their applied tariffs, and then it was just a question how how much um, do we want to reduce the bound um, tariffs, right? And so. So the, the but the point is that you really do need governments to have decided that this is in their own best interest, and then they can sort of bake that into an international agreement, so there's no backsliding. Um, and when I look around the world on some of the biggest issues right now, um, I just don't see an enormous amount of appetite 
to do the kind of grand changes that that one might want. So take subsidies, right? Um, last time I checked, industrial policy right now is pretty hot. Um, so you know, some kind of grand agreement to limit to limit subsidies, which is, you know, ultimately what one would want if one one were to try to seriously constrain what China was doing. If that's going to be multilateral, um, then I'm just not sure the domestic will is there. Um, OK, so then another kind of um, reaction to, to Cleet's paper was that um, Cleet, newsflash everyone, Cleet is American um, and therefore um, this is this is a list of kind of um, ways in which the system could work better to serve American interests. Right. And I I kind of, um, you know, admire the, the, the quest to get the point is to get common ground with the EU. So I kind of fully understand that. Um, but just to kind of point out some of the other things that um, places that aren't, you know, two of the richest places in the world w would kind of want from the system. Um, so, you know, so the um, one thing that was mentioned in the paper was, you know, intellectual property, right? Um, but then the, you know, the original WTO um, agreement, you know, involved a trade-off where actually the US got you know that that was one of the U.S. wins, right? It got rules on intellectual property, and there were other um, uh, there was concessions it made elsewhere. Um, so to sort of say we want to st strengthen those even further, um, that that could be a kind of tough um, trade-off to make. Um, the other thing is obviously lot, there are lots of developing countries in the WTO who are expecting. Um, you know, big benefits from it. Um, and part of the problem was that then China arrived and basically ate their lunch. Um, and so there is there is a sense, I think, among some members that that um, they're kind of owed something that they they didn't they didn't get that first time. Um, and I think that um, it's all very well agreeing an agenda that, you know, again, the EU and the US can, can go forward on. Um, but one does have to kind of think about that. Um, that uh, that kind of wider context. Um, I think the kind of the bigger challenge when thinking about, um, you know, basically how do we make other countries, we, how does the US make other countries do things that the US wants them to do, right? How does the US make other countries lower their tariffs, for example, which are um, on average higher than, than the, the US ones? Um, you know, you have you have carrots and sticks, right? And and the big frustration is that the U.S. doesn't have that many more carrots to offer because its tariffs are already very low. Um, so I suppose there's a kind of a slight note of skepticism skepticism I have about whether even narrow plurilaterals on single issues that were discriminatory um, are going to be enough to you know convince other countries to eventually to come along. Um, I think even with the TPP, there was skepticism whether you know whether China would would really change its practices um, there, and that was obviously a deeper agreement, but with fewer countries. Um, but then, but then, sort of my final point is let's let's sort of follow this through. Um, the big the big the biggest issue is that we are we have the system that we have today, right? And so any deviation from that will be taken as a removal of. Um, a preference that was once given to other countries, right? So supposing you have a plurilateral, just supposing the members decide, you know what, we're going to make this discriminatory. Um, what next, right? Um, now, if it's if it's a big deal, then then maybe other countries retaliate. Um, so how are you going to deal with that, right? The 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 fight we've just had with we the fight the U.S. has just had with um, see this is what living in D.C. does to you. Um, the fight that the U.S. just had. With China, that was um, that you know involved overcoming quite hefty resistance from you know the business community. Um, not everyone was on board at the beginning. Um, is the U.S. ready to pick that kind of battle um, to to erect trade barriers um, to other countries if that turns out to be the stick that you need to get them to do what you want? So with all that, um, I can see Cleet furiously writing notes. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure he'll have a response to, response to all those. Um, with that, uh, I I cede the, the the floor. Thanks, Simaya. And I I'm guilty as well when I'm living abroad. I say we, not referring to my own country. Mark, um, let me turn to you now. Are you skeptical, or do you share um, Cleet's cautious optimism? <laughs> 
Uh, thanks, Julie. And, and let me start by noting that we are moving from non-trade negotiator, but celebrated uh, trade journalist to uh, another former uh, negotiator. Um, you know, it's th this is a great conversation. I think that uh, Cleet's, Cleet's paper is going to be uh, a very important reference point uh, going, going forward. Uh, Cleet and I are former colleagues at USTR and a, a little piece of trivia, Cleet, Cleet later lived in an apartment that I first lived in in Geneva for, for six years. So we, we also have that connection. Now, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the paper focuses on the three pillars of the WTO. And uh, Roberto Acevedo, when he was director general, often highlighted this. There are three pillars. There's uh, the negotiating function, there's dispute settlement um, with the appellate body, and then there's implementation of uh, existing WTO agreements. So I, I think it's really important that, that Cleet highlighted all three of these areas. And with respect to starting with dispute settlement and the appellate body, you know, I, I think he's, he's spot on um, with respect to his uh, analysis. Um, I feel that this is the, the one area that is perhaps most ripe for a multilateral result, notwithstanding the ongoing fishery subsidies um, negotiations. It's unfortunate that, uh, that this US administration has essentially rendered the appellate body uh, non-operational. Um, but that said, if there were to be a Biden administration, I, I think the Trump administration has set things up very well for uh, an incoming administration. Um, I, I think the US could uh, leverage uh, the situation, I mean, the crisis that exists with respect to the appellate body to get some strong reforms. Um, there's already a lot of support in Geneva among many delegations for these kinds of reforms. So. You know, a Biden administration could come in, show new leadership, new U.S. leadership uh, in the WTO and essentially come out uh, a hero. So I, I certainly if we have a Biden administration, I, I'm somewhat optimistic on, on that particular front. Turning uh, to the broad negotiating agenda, um, you know, Cleet has laid out uh, a large number of issues. They are all fundamental issues, very, very important from, uh, you know, the behavior of China with respect to forced tech transfer, uh, state aids to um, the differential uh, in tariff schedules to graduation of developing countries to, you know, IPR intellectual property rights to, you know, labor and environment issues, which have been treated extensively in free trade agreements, but not so much uh, in, in the WTO. Uh, e-commerce. I mean, the list goes on and on. These are all really important issues. Um, however, I am skeptical, frankly, highly skeptical that as a whole, um, they could be taken on certainly multilaterally uh, at this point in time. Um, you know, essentially what we would be talking about is a big new round of negotiations. And, and Cleet doesn't re reference a, a round, but essentially um, that's what it would be. And history teaches us a lot in terms of rounds of negotiations. And this gets to, I, I think, a critical point that Sumaya just uh, raised. The, the whole theory of a round, of, of, of conducting negotiations on a large number of issues simultaneously in the WTO and the GATT before it, um, is that there are trade-offs. There's something for everyone. That's that's the only way to bring it together. And then it's still really difficult. I mean, we've got the recent history of the Doha round. Um, so, you know, the question is, what's in it for a China? Um, I mean, many of these, uh, this, this agenda goes after uh, issues that implicate China. What's in it for an India, South Africa, even many of the smaller developing countries. So, you know, I just don't think it's realistic to to think that these can be taken up as a whole uh, multilaterally. Now on his idea of plurilateral approaches, I, I, I think that's definitely the way to, um, to go. Um, uh, you know, that the question essentially would be who's in and who's out of a particular 
uh, plurilateral negotiation inside the inside the WTO. Is China in? Is it out? Um, they currently are in the e-commerce negotiations, which are plur plurilateral negotiation, and uh, it's hard to imagine how the gaps will be bridged uh, in in that negotiation. Um, Ignacio and I have had this conversation before, and I expect we might get some questions related to it. I, I think that's a fundamental question of who would be in a plurilateral negotiation if the goal uh, is uh, ambition. And frankly, I think it's completely unrealistic to expect that there might be non-MFN plurilaterals inside the WTO, maybe even outside the WTO, because um, you know, there's certainly in regulatory areas, there still are WTO requirements. Um, you know, ultimately, if a plurilateral is to be made part of the legal structure of the WTO, there needs to be a consensus for that. And a, uh, a plurilateral that uh, accords benefits to some and not to others, may even be prejudicial to others, is not going to be accepted into the legal structure of the WTO. Um, you know, Ignacio in his paper, I think, laid out perhaps a more realistic idea. And, and uh, Cleet also refers to this of um, not providing benef dispute settlement uh, rights to a non-participant in a plurilateral. And, you know, maybe that would be um, workable in terms of getting a plurilateral agreed in the WTO. You know, just quickly on the point of tariffs, and I, I totally agree with Sumaya. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, tariffs are, are tough. I mean, tariffs brought down, we're, we're certainly a central reason, if not the central reason that the Doha round uh, collapsed. Um, you know, I just don't see a WTO negotiation, certainly one that would expect uh, a large number of developing countries to bring their rates down to developed level, to US uh, levels. Um, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer has suggested that he might unilaterally raise tariffs. That's always an option. There's something called Article 28 um, that could happen. But then the WTO is truly facing an existential moment. You know, I, I, I think that would be the a bigger risk than what's happened with the appellate body if the U.S. comes in to announce a plan to unilaterally uh, raise its tariffs. You know, I think for better or worse, with tariffs, we're left to, you know, what's been going on for a number of years, and that's bilateral, regional, preferential agreements. And again, Sumaya referred to this. Um, I mean, that's where the game is right now in terms of tariffs, and I think for the foreseeable future. Finally, on implementation, just a few words on this because it's it's the area that gets the least attention, yet uh, this is the day-to-day -day activity of the WTO in Geneva. You know, it's the TBT committee, it's the SPS committee, it's the agriculture committee that is on a daily, weekly basis um, considering implementation of the existing agreements. Uh, and it's, it's very important work and, uh, you know, it should continue, it should be strengthened. Um, you know, I am skeptical about punitive approaches, though, and, and the U.S., along with a number of other countries, Argentina, et cetera, have some proposals in this regard. Um, you know, I understand the frustra frustrations, the motivations behind the idea of punitive measures. Um, I'm a, a bit of the mind that if it's not uh, broken, don't try to fix it. Yes, there's a problem with notifications, no doubt about it, and there should be better a better record of notifications, but I, I question whether a punitive approach uh, will work. Um, you know, I, I think what's been going on with counter notifications is really good work. For example, in the Committee on Agriculture in the US and a number of other countries have, have counter notified subsidy programs uh, by India. And, you know, that's, that's a name and shame approach uh, that can be, um, in fact, may be more uh, beneficial. So, you know, looking at the three pillars, those are my perspectives. Um, you know, there's much to chew on here, and I, I look forward to uh, further discussion and, and uh, responding to some of the questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, before we go on, I encourage you all to please uh, submit your questions in the chat function, anything, and we'll um, make this as uh, interactive despite the Zoom restrictions. Um, Cleet, coming back to you, of course, I think you probably would want to jump in on many of those things, um, and you certainly can 
pick and choose. But why don't we start with why don't we start with the white elephant, China, um, and um, and try to uh, if you can walk us through how you might unpack the sort of uh, for better la lack of a better term, game of chicken about who's going to move what in, what instrument to make progress possible. Sure, and and I promise I'm going to do that in just a second. But I I, I can't help myself. I do want to at least quickly respond. Uh, to the to the to the cynicism, and I, I think it's totally warranted. To be honest with you, um, it, it, you're right to be skeptical. I mean, we what is our track record over the last you know number of decades in trying to reform the WTO? I mean, we we haven't been able to get it done, and and so everyone is right to be skeptical, and and I get that governments are going to do what's in their own best interest. And you know, look, my point wasn't to put on something on the table that was going to be this magic solution that everyone's going to say, "Great, that's you know, that's what we want to do." My point was really just to illustrate the scope of the problems, so we can have real conversations, and then we can eventually reach a decision point. You know, are we able to do this through the WTO or not? And I know in some ways that almost sounds at odds with my entire purpose. Look, I'm I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, I, I I've worked for a series of happy warriors throughout my career. Um, and, you know, I believe we can try to get this done, but at some point, I think if we make the effort and it's unrealistic, we do need to think about what does that universe look like? Because what I do know is this, the universe we're in today is not a desirable one. And, you know, again, let me, I do want to just touch on this for a second because I started getting into this in my intro, but let me just say it a little more succinctly. You know, Mark, I thank you for focusing on implementation and monitoring. You know, the, the bottom line is, Countries don't follow the most basic obligations to, to, to notify their rules and measures, and that makes it hard for businesses. That's not ideal for anyone. You know, negotiations, we beat that over, over, you know, we've talked about that already. I mean, we haven't been getting agreements. That's not ideal for anyone. And on dispute settlement, it takes too long. It's gone beyond its mandate. And in a lot of ways, it hasn't gotten non-market economies right, in my opinion. So it's all, you know, look, it, the current situation is pretty dire. So I think the question really shouldn't be, and, and Sumaya touched on this, I mean, the question for countries can't be, do we want to make incremental changes to that? And is that a plus or minus for me? I really do think we need to step back and say, hey, what does a system look like that works for us? And if we can build it on the foundation created by the WTO, that's fantastic. But if we can't, let's do something else. And because we don't want this world that we have where countries are more and more turning to unilateral measures to deal with these problems. Perfect segue into China. <laughs> you know, how did we get where we got with China? Part of the reason that the U.S. acted unilaterally here um, was because, you know, something I touched on in my paper, you know, the rules in the WTO didn't cover some of those practices. So it had to go outside the system. And secondly, to the extent it could have operated within the system and tried to change those rules, there wasn't a high enough level of ambition to do so. So that's why it felt like its hand was forced. But with China, what I have realized and what I have really has come uh, to be very clear to me in sort of the experience over the past three and a half years is there's only so much we can do bilaterally with them. You know, and, and we went down this path and we have 300 and some odd billion dollars of tariffs in place at this point. And they're still not making the commitments that they need to enforce technology transfer and these other issues. So at some point, this bilateral approach just isn't gonna get it done. It makes it seem to China like it's this competition between these two heavyweights. And so we need to figure out a way to get into a multilateral system where the, the weight of the world can be brought to bear and China is truly seen as an international outlier for some of the things that it's doing. And that's why I advocate bringing this in here. Now I'm totally realistic. Uh, to say, you know, that in the short term, China is not going to agree to all of these things. And that's why I was sort of went down this path on non-MFN plurilaterals. And I, again, I take the point that some countries may not want that to be part of the system. But I, I, I think, you know, otherwise, the alternative is we just do it outside the WTO. And, you know, I think everyone has to make a decision. Is that what they prefer? So, so I guess what I'm really trying to say is, we have to change the question that everyone is asking. Let's stop asking, you know, this status quo is unacceptable. So don't look at this as like, we're gonna have this status quo, or we're gonna move a little here, a little there. Look at this as like, we are in a brave new world where people are taking all these different actions. Either we try to resuscitate this thing through this big bold action or we don't. Um, 
so I know I may have went off on a little tangent from what you were trying to get at, Julia, but, um, but, but really that's the way that I think we have to look at it. And some of this stuff, I think, you know, in here, developing country status, for example, you know, that just has to be the cost of doing business for China and the WTO system. You know, it's just, you know, the second largest economy in the world can't be given preferential treatment vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Europe and everyone else. And I would hope that by putting China in a different category, it makes it easier for all of us in the developed world to provide unique benefits to LDCs and those who truly need it. And so, you know, the idea here is not to get rid of developing country status for countries that truly need it. But what I talk about in the paper is really making it fact-based and objective. Can you establish that in this sector or this product or this country that you really need some help? And if, if you can, you get it. But if you're the largest, second largest economy in the world, you're a dominant player in, in advanced technology, you probably don't deserve it. And I think unless we actually recognize that, I mean, we, we are going to be a little bit hopeless. Thanks for that. Um, does anyone have a two finger on that? Or, or should I? Yeah, could I? Okay. All right. No, so, Sumaya, you, you want to come first? Yeah, yeah. You go for it. Okay, no, listen, I wanted to start uh, first on this question, which I think is totally critical. You cannot do everything at the same time. And of course, China is the toughest issue. So I will come back uh, to China in a minute. But first, I think it's going to be important to say, if we want to get the WTO in the track of relevance again, what it is that is doable within the next let's say two years. We need to fix the issue of dispute settlement. I totally agree with Mark that that's the issue that absolutely needs to be fixed at the multilateral level. We needed to give some credibility to the WTO negotiating function. And for that purpose, it's better to concentrate not on the toughest issues, but on issues which are of general relevance. That's what I think. Uh, if we manage to conclude the e-commerce negotiation, if we manage to find a way of integrating a meaningful agreement of e-commerce into the WTO, if we manage to do some progress on the issues relating to sustainability, then we have created the confidence that will make it easier to tackle some of the toughest issues, which are, of course, the issues relating to China. And all the issues which I have mentioned so far are issues where normally it should be possible to engage with China. And indeed, are issues which can also test the credibility of China. In the fishery subsidies negotiation, you would expect China to take exactly the same commitments as the United States and the European Union. You would not expect them to claim any kind of special and differential treatment. If there's going to be an agreement to eliminate the tariffs on environmental goods, or on the uh, pharmaceutical and medical products, we would expect China to take absolutely the same commitments as the United States and the European Union. And that's a way of testing where China is serious or not. In some areas, we are not the most highly controversial areas. So what it is that you can do on the toughest issues like uh, industrial subsidies? Now, I think that despite the fact uh, that we are living in a situation in which subsidies are becoming much more common, much more used, uh, still, I would expect that both the European Union and the United States States would be interested in having a stronger rules internationally on subsidies. But what I think that you need to do in order to advance on that, it has been very easy for China because during the last uh, three years we have been in this trilateral discussion, discussing between the United States, the European Union and Japan, the perfect rules on industrial subsidies. But we have never really managed to go beyond this trilateral group and to try to begin to do outreach and to get other countries interested in reform. The only way that China could change one day, if they really see there is a big coalition out there who is ready to negotiate on those issues, not only on industrial subsidies, by the way, but also on other issues relating to the level playing field. And then you can challenge China to say, do you want to join or not? Of course, if they decide not to join, it's going to be a very tough issue. And then we would need to take some very tough decisions. Are we ready to subscribe to these commitments among ourselves, even if China is not there? I think that's going to be a very, very tough uh, question. But at least that should not prevent us from starting the process and building as strong as possible coalition 
not only OECD countries, also non-OECD countries that agree that there's a need to have a stronger rules on industrial subsidies, that agree that there's a need to have rules on state-owned enterprises, that agree that there's a need to have rules on forced technology transfer. And once we have built that coalition uh, within the framework of the WTO, a plurilateral coalition, of course, then it will be a question, is China ready to join uh, or not? And uh, it's not going to be solved within the next two years. It is something which is certainly going to take a much longer time to come to come to a conclusion. Now, on the issue of plurilaterals, it's very clear. It's the only way that you are going to have the development of negotiation with WTO is plurilaterals which are open, which are inclusive. And there's a lot of countries participating in the e-commerce negotiations. There's a lot of countries participating in investment facilitation negotiations. Apart from India and South Africa, that don't participate in anything. Practically all the emerging economies, including China, are participating in those negotiations. Now, the question is going to be how we manage to conclude agreements which combine ambition with inclusiveness is possible. It requires creativity, but it is possible. And how to avoid the free riding problem. But the free riding problem would need to be a case by case solution. It's not the same type of problem when you are negotiating an agreement on e commerce and when you are negotiating an agreement on industrial subsidies. I agree with Mark that the agreement that derogates from MFN is simply not possible. It's not going to happen. You need to have consensus to bring agreements in the WTO. But at the same time, it should be tough for a country to block an agreement when it is an agreement which is not preventing uh, that country from enjoying any of the rights that it already has, simply because it doesn't want other countries to take uh, additional commitments. That's going to be a tough decision for countries to take. And what you need to do is to have a sufficiently significant number of countries that want to bring that agreement to the WTO and then challenge countries to block that agreement. Great, sure. um, yeah, OK, so um, uh, uh, I guess a few different things. Um, so um, Ignacio just talked about the kind of next two years or so. Um, I, I suppose I have a question for for um, for, for you uh, collectively, um, which is um, well. So there are two things you can do with 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 China and subsidies, right? You can negotiate basically um, the ability to defend yourself um, against subsidized um, Chinese exports. Um, or ideally, everyone could agree just not to subsidize in the first place. Um, I, I'm really, really skeptical that even in five years time, China is going to want to sort of seriously um, do the second. And so, you know, one question is, are we are we really just in a world where we're arguing about the level of, of countervailing duties that we can apply? Um, OK, but then so that's sort of one note of would one note of doubt. Um, a second is um, so two years ago, um, I wrote a piece, a cover story for The Economist, um, which um, was fun. And it was it was basically a kind of it was like a sinking ship and it was called How to Save the WTO. Um, and there was this kind of grand plan um, that was that was afoot. Um, where basically you have bad cop, which is the US, they have all these tariffs on China. Um, and look, you have good cop, you have the Europeans and the Japanese, and they're trying to work on these trilateral discussions with the US. And maybe the US has basically created leverage. And you say, look, sign up to these rules. And in exchange, we're going to reduce the tariff threats. Um, so I guess that hasn't really gone anywhere so far. I mean, there's there's been some progress in terms of text, but I see no um signs that that were anywhere near you know that being taken to the chinese um but i guess the the question from a u.s perspective is that you know i hear a lot i hear a lot of chat about um you know the biden administration working with allies right and kind of coordinating and going to china what ignacio just described was allies saying look china we're going to agree a plurilateral amongst ourselves, limiting our own subsidies. Do you want to join in? I, I, like, I, I don't know why China would want to join in on that. Surely they're just going to be like, yeah, great. You go and limit your subsidies. We'll keep ours. Um, so, you know, an alternative would be that this coordination with allies involves the EU. It basically involves the US asking the EU to generate some leverage of their own. Right. So we've got the Section 301. We've got all these tariffs on China. Um, that's that's something, right? The US has created a kind of carrot that it can use to entice the Chinese to do something. Um, I don't think that carrot's big enough to get them to change their economic model. Um, but it, it maybe it could maybe it could change change their behavior in some way. And so the, I guess the question is, you know, 
at the point at which a US administration starts coordinating with allies, it's going to start asking allies to do stuff. Um, what, what's that stuff? Right. Is that is that stuff a European Section 301? I see no appetite from the Europeans to do that. Um, but I don't know if you ask really nicely. Um, that was kind of a joke anyway, but I'll, I'll, I'll again, I'll stop talking now. Are you the first person to refer to Section 301? Withdrawal of the, you know what I mean? <laughs> Great, thanks. And I mean, this is already really good uh, conversations and a conversation I will note. And there are times where I refer to myself as, you know, the cynical former negotiator. I, I really like to think of myself as more the re realistic uh, former negotiator based on you know, a lot of experience uh, over time, but still very aspirational in terms of hopes for the multilateral system. Most of my career was uh, was multilateral, going back before the WTO to 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 the GATT. And um, you know, in fact, there was a great period um, in the early years of the WTO. Things were happening. I mean, there was excitement. There was you know the work in the committees. There were results. They were plurilateral results. Um, some leftover issues, the ITA, basic telecom, financial services. I mean, real progress, real excitement, real momentum. Yes, incremental, but it was working. And then what happened? Well, we decided we need a big new round. And, you know, it was it was related to, you know, services not necessarily moving forward, except with basic telecom and financial. And I think more importantly, ag. I mean, agriculture is always before China, agriculture was always the hard issue and re remains a really hard issue. And the conclusion was reached, we need a big round. That's what we do. Well, in fact, I think it was um, it was short-sighted. Um, it was naive um, in terms of what the implications of that might be. And, and now 20 plus years later, we know what the implications are. Uh, we had drift, we had failures, we had uh, you know a toxic environment for for so long, um, we had abandoned that like incremental. Let's 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 get points on the board where we can uh, approach. And now I think that's what we've got to get back to: uh, getting points on the board. We can't in the WTO afford another failure. And if you go too big, then the risk of a big failure and you know the organization imploding uh, is you know a, a, a pretty serious one. Um, so, you know, I just want to highlight that. And I would also note that, um, you know, with respect to China, I mean, these are, these are fundamental issues and they need to be pursued. They need to be addressed. I like, you know, Samaya's uh, idea of uh, maybe the Europeans, as you refer to as a carrot, seems more like a stick. Um, but, you know, maybe the Europeans could do more in terms of adding uh, leverage uh, in terms of confronting China. Um, you know, that said, there was a important trilateral uh, initiative with US, Japan, uh, EU. Um, you know, they, they had some initial results in terms of a proposal on, uh, on state aids. Um, you know, what, there's been no follow up though. It's, this is the time to recruit, to go to other countries, uh, including developing countries. And there are many developing countries, as Samaya reference who have had their lunch eaten to get more and more support to build out um, and get to a point where, okay, we're ready to launch a plurilateral negotiation in this area. There's still the issue of can China be in or out? And actually, I think there would be an inclination on China's part to be in because by being in, it can undermine more effectively. I mean, I, I there, there is that dynamic and that's where I think Ignacio and I differ a bit in terms of you know the the cost versus benefits of of having China involved in a plurilateral negotiation, and I, I don't think there's any obvious answer. You know, I can be persuaded by Ignacio's perspective, but but at the moment there needs to be an effort to recruit, build up support. Let's do this in the WTO. Let's find a way to do it, but at the same time, let's pursue other initiatives where we might have uh, uh, successes. Um, in the nearer future.
Um, Ignacio, Ignacio, I'm going to give you a two for it. Like, 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 uh, like, like you know, know, also respond, respond to some of our, our, our friends', friends uh, questions, uh, questions as to what the EU might be able to do additionally, additionally the request to the United States or the others. Uh, uh, sorry, to, Julie, I didn't quite hear to what your question was, but I mean, I was thinking of actually responding to a point that uh, Sumagia made about. Uh, leverage and also to comment on what Mark uh, just said. I totally agree with him that getting China to change its behavior is going to require a combination of elements. It's going to require a sufficiently big coalition of countries which are ready to move ahead. And building that coalition is something that we have not started doing because we have just been concentrated on working on the trilateral where we actually much more focusing on the outreach and building a sufficiently big coalition of countries. That would make it politically much more difficult for China just to simply stay out. Secondly, it requires leverage. That I totally agree with, uh, with Sumaria. I think that in my view, the European Union has always indicated that we are ready to exercise leverage, not in the direction of the Section 301, but in the direction of being much tougher with Chinese subsidies. And we have been quite tough when it comes to the use of the countervailing duty instrument, including doing things that the United States has not done so far, like countervailing Chinese subsidies in third countries, which is something which I understand the United States has not done so far. And we are now in the process of developing a new legislative instrument to tackle with the impact of subsidies in the single market. So there is certainly thing that we are ready to do in terms of enhancing leverage with a China. I mean, part of this issue has been, the United States has been using its Section 301 leverage, not for achieving any objectives in relation to, to the issue of uh, subsidies. It has been using this on the pure bilateral context. And I agree with you, a big question mark for the next US administration is what is going to happen after the phase one agreement? Is there going to be a phase two? Or is the new US administration going to say what happens with these studies is also going to depend on the willingness of China to tackle issues like subsidies, which we know perfectly well are not, never going to be tackled in a bilateral, in a bilateral uh, context. So I think you would need to combine elements. You would need to combine a much stronger use of the tools that you have under WTO to counter subsidies, building a sufficiently strong coalition that puts uh, the pressure on China, Although at the end of the day, everything is going to depend on whether China considers that it is in their own interest to reform. And there, I think we also would need to think creatively about how we build different elements within this agreement. It cannot be an agreement which is just purely a punitive agreement, and it certainly has to be an agreement which is not targeting China. It has to discipline subsidies no matter where those subsidies come. And if China is not the only country in the world which is actually granting subsidies. Julia, I'm going to jump back in here if, if, if that's all right. I, I just, I think this is a great conversation and I think uh, it, hopefully it's achieving um, two things, which one, I think this conversation about the need for, for European ambition is the right one. I mean, this is a conversation we've had a lot of times and I do hope that the Europeans can be more forceful vis-a-vis -vis China in all different contexts, in the WTO and outside the WTO as well, where it's warranted. And then I think the U.S. at the same time is, has to do the same thing. You know, we need to, we may need to continue to do things um, bilaterally with China and, and to defend our interests, but also I think we can be more multilateral. And so I think it's going to take both of us to compromise a little bit on our approach and, and to ensure that they are complementary. Now, the other point is, I mean, I think this question of the non-plurilateral MFN and how do you get China to agree? I mean, that I will grant you, that is the hardest question of all of these. You know, in some ways, I think, you know, it's it's relative, I don't want to say easy, <laughs> but you know, look, on, on, the, on the dispute settlement system, I think if the US shows some flexibility and preserves a two-tier system, um, you know, Ignacio outlined some conditions there. And then on the European side, if they start, um, you know, uh, recognizing the need that we have for structural structural reform with the role of the secretariat, and with you know, the role of the appellate body. I mean, I think we can get there, but at the end of the day, this really is gonna come down to how do we get people who don't wanna change to actually change? And that's why I kept saying uh, in my previous answers that we need to change the conversation. And we need folks to recognize that 
the WTO as it exists today is no longer a viable solution. And, and, and I think until we have that recognition, there isn't much of an incentive to change. And you know, I think you posed the question to, would you rather we stuck around in this system and had um, you know, some sort of plurilateral that maybe didn't grant the benefits to everyone, or should we do it separate from the WTO? And I think those are, you need to pose the question that way, and then maybe you get a, a little bit of a different answer. Um, but again, this is the hardest one. I struggled with this the most in terms of putting this paper together, is just trying to figure out how do you change that dynamic so that there is an incentive to say yes, rather than an incentive to maintain the status quo. Because I think from China's perspective, the status quo at the WTO has been just fine. Um, one last point I remembered I wanted to make, and this is on something Sumaya said earlier, you know, I think we've, we need to fight the, one of the things that struck me in Geneva when I was there is, is you know, the U.S. is pushing for liberalization because we believe that liberalization is generally good for everyone's economy. And a lot of the, the, the arguments you heard um, from folks purportedly who were interested in, in helping develop their own economies was that they needed trade barriers to develop. And we need to change that conversation. This can't be that developing countries need trade barriers in order to develop. I think we have to go back and look at the models of, of the Asian tigers, of Singapore, of Korea, and show that trade liberalization actually is what led them, um, led them to greater economic growth. It's a very hard conversation to have right now, including in the United States. But one of the things I talk about in here is having the um, WTO work with the OECD and other organizations so we can reestablish that trade barriers are not the answer for all of us, uh, including the develop, developing world. any immediate responses to that i apologize for my technical difficulties i'm back on can i, um, can I say something maybe a little bit provocative which is that um i uh, so a lot of the um most angry complaints about the wto and the dispute settlement system have come from the mouths of trade lawyers in the us who have seen you know countervailing duties and anti-dumping um remedies sort of um in their, in their eyes undermined, um, you know, by decisions that the appellate body has made, right? And so one could um, attribute a lot of the frustration with the WTO from a US DC perspective to um, the WTO curbing America's ability to put on tariffs, right? Um, and so, you know, it is sort of 30,000, I can I can come up with a kind of detailed explanation for why it's totally consistent with saying, come on, developing countries, why don't you understand that tariffs are bad for you? Um, but it, it, in one sense, one could one could see um, a bit of attention, right? On the one hand, the US is arguing, no, we need the freedom. Your lawyers have taken away our freedom to apply all these defensive tariffs, but also um, you need to stop putting on tariffs. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I'll respond to that. I mean, and again, as someone who was involved with the Section 301 action, I mean, the view from the US was that the system as constituted wasn't solving that problem. Additional leverage was needed to do it. And, and let's remember, I mean, the US did just lose a WTO dispute on this issue. And, and I mean, that is, the, the WTO doesn't prohibit use. I, I had an old colleague who always said, there's no WTO jail. <laughs> it doesn't prohibit you from doing anything. It's merely meant to help uh, ensure that disputes don't get out of hand, that they don't escalate. And you know, ultimately, this was something created in the wake of World War II, which didn't want trade protectionism to lead to wars. And so that's the idea of the system, is it helps constrain, or it, it, it helps try to prevent things from escalating, but it never prevents you from doing it. Um, so you know, that, I think that is important to remember but again, I, I go back to the fundamental point. You know, if you look at the WTO and the way that it's set up today on tariffs, you know, the US and the EU and others like Australia, we have very low tariff rates. We're prevented from the system from ever raising them, but other countries are allowed to go up to over 100% on certain product lines. And that's simply not fair. And until you kind of get to the, the place where everyone says, tariffs in fact are not good for development, it's going to be hard to get people to sort of decide that they don't want that they want to lower their tariff rates. But again, if you're going to have a system that continues to work for the United States moving forward, there needs to be more equilibrium there uh, in the way that different different people are treated.
Sure. And I, if I can jump in, you know, I, I, I finally did my Q and A function. I see that there are a number of questions and it's probably going to be pretty difficult to, uh, uh, to, to cover all of those. Um, you know, the, the, the question of plurilateral, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a, uh, I do not see prospects except perhaps with respect to dispute settlement and the appellate body crisis um, for there to be strong uh, multilateral results anytime soon. I'd love to see it happen on fisheries subsidies. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the likes of China and India uh, and some others will um, will seek to gut it um, and and stand behind uh, developing country status in in seeking to do that. And there just won't be a strong result there multilaterally. So you know, I I do think plurilateral for the moment, um, you know, not forever is the you know the the way to go. Um, you know, it's just a question of is it inside the WTO or outside? And if it's inside the WTO, who's involved? And you know, those are questions we're gonna have to grapple with um, going forward. There was the TISA negotiation, which was outside um, and you know, it was making progress that eventually collapsed. Um, there've been other plurilateral negotiations outside uh, the WTO, but you know, in, in terms of you know, I, I, what's important is getting an agreement that's got strong discipline, sets a strong standard, and then leveraging that um, with respect to those who aren't inside. And it may require finding points of leverage that are not in that agreement, um, whether it's tariffs. And Cleet is absolutely right. I mean, you can we can raise our tariffs. Um, we we may be found, and we were found. To be non-compliant, but you know we can still do it. Um, it. It doesn't mean we've left the WTO. It means that others can retaliate against us. So, you know, I, I think finding, uh, being creative in terms of finding uh, leverage um, to eventually get those who are outside to uh, to gravitate towards that high standard that has been established in a plurilateral negotiation. Um, is really important. And, you know, before we will conclude, I, I, I want to get this out too. Um, and it's probably an irresponsible question, but I think it needs to be, um, it needs to be floated. Um, and that's uh, the, the question of what is a world without the WTO? I mean, I've, I've got my own strong views on this. I've, I've been a multilateralist. I, you know, believed in the GATT and, and the WTO, but I and mean, there are valid arguments and the tariff differential is a valid argument on, you know, why it's not fair. Like my dad used to say, life's not fair, WTO is not fair. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but what would we have if there were no WTO? Um, and we'd have a lot more freedom for maneuver. Um, you know, what would be the consequences of that, I I think ultimately they'd be pretty dire consequences. We you know we we we'd have the preferential the FTAs that would fill that vacuum, um, but they're also different and they're preferential. Um, so likely it would create a pretty chaotic situation if no longer you've got MFN uh, tariffs and the global economy would suffer. And I think it would suffer more than it did in two thousand eight, and I think it would suffer more than it has this past year um, with with COVID and developing countries would suffer the most. So, you know, I think it's important to look at that scenario and maybe it can help in terms of re-upping the commitment and uh, beginning to think outside the box and not go to those comfortable places, um, which the US does, which I think certainly India and South Africa do in terms of trying to block anything uh, constructive uh, in the WTO, but it, you know, without considering that scenario, it's it's hard to have the commitment that you know. I think I think Cleet is talking about to to really undertake these fundamental uh, changes. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'd like to turn to a, a, a question from Cleet's colleague Chuck Levy, and this concerns the concept of uh, of constructive ambiguity and the appellate body. 
So the, he says the dispute over the appellate body's overreach, adding to and subtracting from the agreements has challenged the continued use of constructive ambiguity. Going forward, is it reasonable to conclude that at least the US will understand the need, for, the need to support this by, by a bipartisan basis? I think in the US, the answer is, is pretty clear. Um, and, and, you know, Chuck and I, um, you know, have worked together on this and actually he, he comes from uh, the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm, I've been a Republican. I worked in this administration and, you know, we agree on all of these things. And I think that's what the Trump administration has actually done or tried to do is sort of show how bipartisan these issues actually are. Um, and this issue in particular that the U.S. has raised, I do think, um, is something that's going to have a bipartisan uh, basis going forward. I, I'm very interested in the answer from the Europeans on this one, quite frankly, if I can, can call out my friends, um, because I really don't do think it does come down to, you know, where is Europe going to be on this issue? Because I think the answer from the U.S. is pretty clear. No, ha happy to take uh, this point uh, of Chuck uh, and also to comment a little bit more broadly on the WTO dispute settlement. Because I think if there's something which is really urgent uh, to find a solution in the WTO is to find a way of restoring a binding dispute settlement with form a body body in a manner that all the members of the WTO are satisfied that this is a system that works properly. Now, I think that in order to do that, uh, first of all, uh, there are a number of elements which related to improving the appellate function, responding to a number of concerns that have been raised uh, by the United States. And quite frankly, it should not be so difficult uh, to reach a consensus on that, because to a large extent, the worker test, or it is not perfect, already provides the elements of a response. It is a question about how to structure in a stronger and more clear legally binding uh, language. Then you look to need to look into some of the questions about the organization of the upper body, how to enhance the accountability of the upper body vis-a-vis -vis the members while maintaining independence. And there are ideas that have been presented on that by Jennifer Hillman and others. And again, that is a topic on which we should be able to have a conversation because it's perfectly possible to maintain an independent upper body and to reinforce its accountability vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the members. Then you have the question which is raised in the CLIC's uh, paper about uh, the organization of the secretariat, uh, how the secretariat should be providing its support to the upper body. I would not say that I agree 100% with what he says in his paper, but again, I see there's also merits of a system of checks, and we should try to see what is the best way to structure the support by the upper body secretary. And then we come to, of course, the issue which is uh, the most difficult issue, the issue of standards of review. Now, I think we will be open, in my view, in the European Union to have a serious conversation about this. Is there a need uh, to define with more precision the standards of review, should we do this specifically in the context of trade remedies or on a broader basis? All of these are issues which uh, I think are worth having a conversation. I would only make a plea, let's look at this not exclusively from the perspective of those who are basically defending the companies in anti-dumping and countervailing duty proceedings. Of course, that is an important issue. It is part of what we need to look into to have a balance. But don't forget that there is also a huge number of actions being taken in certain countries on anti-dumping, on countervailing duties, which are having a very significant impact on our exports. And I think that we would not want either to go towards a system in which there is a total deference to what the decisions we are taking by the authorities which take an anti-dumping on countervailing duty action. We need to find a balance. We need to see how to structure the, the standard of review in a manner which is uh, um, better formulated. Although inevitably, Chuck, there's always going to be a certain degree of constructive ambiguity. Although, of course, now that everyone knows that there's a binding dispute settlement, negotiators are going to be much, much more careful when it comes to actually crossing the teeth and crossing the eyes. Because I think that everyone in the Uruguay round, when they were concluding negotiations, knew that there was going to be a binding dispute settlement, but clearly they have not internalized the consequences of that. Now, finally, I would have to say that uh, the paper by Cliff also includes some elements related to timeliness. And I think that there is certainly worthwhile also to have a conversation about that. 
I wouldn't go as far as it goes. I don't think that you can eliminate Article 21.5. That would simply make it too easy to go to retaliation. But I think that creatively there are things that can be done to, to shorten the timelines of the dispute settlement procedure. For me, the fundamental plea for the United States on this is let's focus on finding a solution to dispute settlement on its own merits. Let's not try to create too many linkages between a solution in dispute settlement and other aspects of WTO reform. Because the more that you create those linkages, possible to get a resolution to the dispute settlement issue. And quite frankly, the longer that you have a WTO without functioning dispute settlement, the more that the type of problems that we have been experiencing over the last three years are going to proliferate and are going to extend. I think at this point in time, we have a situation in which basically the WTO does not apply in relationship between the United States and China. The more that you actually have a situation of a non-functional dispute settlement system, the more that there is a risk that this is going to influence behavior much beyond the US-China uh, action. Of course, we are trying to, to keep some stopgaps uh, through the multi-party interim arbitration agreement, but at the end of the day, this is not optimal. We should really try to find a solution that brings also the United States back into the system that we created together. I mean, after all, it was the United States much more than the European Union who was pushing for binding dispute settlement when we were negotiating the Uruguay round. So I, I just want to jump in here if I can for a second, um, just to say, you know, this is an issue that Ignacio and I have actually spent a lot of time talking about in particular since I, I left the government. And I do think that there are a lot of commonalities uh, between us. And I think there could be a lot of commonalities between the United States and the EU. Let me just say very succinctly, the way that I thought about it and tried to present it in, in this paper was really four buckets that would need to be fixed in dispute settlement. And the first one, which gets to, to Chuck's question, you know, is the question of adjudicative approach. You know, what, what is the method of review and, and, and what can the adjudicators look at? And, you know, I think David Walker has done a good job in sort of starting that process. Um, we would probably go a little bit further, but that is a core element of it. I think it's great that the European Union would be open to that. You know, the second one where we probably go a little farther than the European Union would like to, but I hope they would consider it, you know, would be this issue of, what is the respective role between the secretariat and the adjudicators themselves and how do we strengthen the independence of the decision makers uh, instead of having a completely secretariat driven process and we look at things like you know allowing for appellate body members to have um, their own clerks or having term limits on secretariat members and things like that and hopefully that would help lock in i mean the, you know you need to lock in adjudicative changes by changing the nature of the secretariat. And the third point, which is important, and again, I might go further <laughs> than Ignacio on, on timeliness, you know, really we can't have situations like Airbus and Boeing where we're litigating this thing for 20 years and not getting results for our companies or our people. Um, and, and really, if you think back to the creation of the WTO, the idea on dispute settlement was that it would be as quick as 301, so there wouldn't be the need to act unilaterally under the US domestic statute. And so I really am trying to come up with ideas that we can get back to that roughly one, one and a half year time frame for all of dispute settlement and then to be able to, re to retaliate if appropriate quickly after that. Ignacio talked a little bit about the idea on 21.5, um, you know, which I think, again, we should consider. It certainly eliminates the sequencing problem. But one idea I just want to highlight there that I think is worth considering is changing the nature of the RPT. And the way that I have envisioned it in my paper would be that after the panel makes its decision, you have an automatic one-year RPT. So you've already been found guilty, if you will, by the WTO. That starts the clock to needing to change your measure. Now, if you want to appeal, that's fine, and maybe you will get it overturned, but that's still, that time still counts against you. And the whole idea there is that people will only appeal if they really need to, and if they really think there's a legitimate chance of getting it overturned, not to simply extend the dispute. And that will help reduce resources needed in Geneva. It will help keep the appellate body to its mandate, and it will lead to a situation where if America decides it has a problem, it can get an answer quicker through dispute settlement. And so, um, you know, that's one of the ideas that I think is a little more provocative, but gets to the timeliness. And then the last point, 
I think Ignacio and I agree. I might put a greater emphasis on it. I do think, again, we cannot discount the linkages to negotiations and, and, and the nature, the fact that you need to fix that to fix dispute settlement and the other way around. But, I, but, I, but, but on all of this, I will say, I recognize, you know, we may need to be incremental here. And my idea was not to say you need to do all of this all at once or the WTO is lost, but it really was to give us a vision for where we want to go over time to actually, again, have a system fit for, for purpose. Hi, can I jump in? Um, uh, okay, so um, I actually had a conversation, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday about um, Secretariat and the pilot body that I, so this nugget that I sh would share, which is that um, there may be a, a sort of tension between what you want the role of the Secretariat to be and sort of legitimacy. So the point was made to me that there are some members of the appellate body who are not picked for their um, judicial brilliance, um, but rather for geographic representation purposes. Um, and that means that essentially they end up relying on the Secretariat very heavily. Um, and so whoever that Secretariat is, they're going to have a lot of influence. Um, and there was a recent paper by um, Joseph Paul Wallen and um, others that, that essentially, um, I think it argued that the Secretariat had more influence over the decisions than the appellate body members did. So it's, it's clearly, you know, an issue. Um, I guess I kind of wanted to sort of tie something Ignacio said um, to this broader question. So Ignacio was saying, you know, please let's not think about um, dispute settlement reform purely from the perspective of basically, you know, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna insert this, but steel lawyers. Um, uh, let's let's think more broadly. Um, and I think essentially what that where that gets you is one of the one of the complaints from the U.S. administration has been that the um, appellate body's decisions have been too it's been too difficult to overturn historic decisions about U.S. trade remedies. Right? The, there was a sort of idea that um, there needed to be some kind of consistency. Um, and even though they're not supposed to create new precedent, that was essentially what was what was happening there. Um, and because that set of rulings did not favor um, the trade remedies bar um, in the US, uh, you know, that has created some discontent. Um, there's a sort of awkward fact that USTR has been quite happy to file what it regards as systemic cases and that it hopes will set a precedent for future future cases. Now, it hasn't always won those in the way that it won right but you know it's it's not obvious to me that um when the decision goes in the us's favor um that ditching out any idea of precedent or, or stability of of the kind of judicial system over time is necessarily the right idea um and so i would just kind of push back slightly on that um on that part of the argument and and raise the question of you know if we have a Biden administration if there is a, a broader thinking about dispute settlement maybe that's one area where um where there may not be such a, a problem you know if I, if, if I can quickly jump in because I know we're almost out of time Julian hopefully I, I haven't cut you off in terms of bringing us to a close but uh no, I, I mean, this is this is a really great discussion on, you know, the implications of dispute settlement and, and reform in this area. And I think my last point is a really interesting one. Um, you know, I was a uh, longtime policy negotiator, uh, not not in general counsel's office like Cleet. And, you know, I, I think that's an interesting question. Um, but uh, there's another aspect of Cleet's paper, which, you know, I find interesting, I think warrants perhaps future discussion. And that's on the possibility of doing something in the WTO that's not binding or initially not binding, and you know might involve putting together, um, you know, ideas on best practices. Um, you know, and I, I years ago I would have said no way. That's that's not how the WTO operates. We we've got enforceable um, we've got enforceable rules. Um, we're not like the UN, we're not like UN agencies. Um, it really matters here. But, you know, I, I'm second guessing that a bit. And, you know, I wonder if some of these, um, these subsidies questions, uh, you know, notwithstanding that, you know, the China, um, the, the China challenge, which is huge, um, you know, maybe there should be efforts to start to look at uh, new approaches on subsidies, building on the existing SEM agreement,
um, and, and perhaps not necessarily to be binding uh, uh, initially. And Michael Smart put out a question, which I think is relevant, and Sumai had referenced this earlier too. You know, industrial policy is becoming more popular in the time of COVID, and you know, I, I think more and more countries, including the United States, but you know, the Indias of the world, and are are looking to have like new uh, programs. Um, so you know, that that's would be part of the context of this. So you know, I'm not an advocate. I'm not necessarily convinced, but I think Cleet putting it out there was was an important thing in this paper. Thanks. And cognizant, we have two minutes to go. I would like to turn to a question posed by a Jew Economic Center partner, Penny Noss, um, to take a slightly different tack, and that's on environmental and labor standards. So, and we haven't sort of drilled down on that today. Of course, we have, we could go on and on and on. Uh, I'm not going to add another half an hour to this session, but if we could do a lightning round, um, starting um, starting backwards. So first Mark, then Sumaya, then Ignacio, then Cleet to close us out. Yeah, so I, I didn't see the question, but uh, I'll, you know, and I, before, most of my career was was uh, was WTO multilateral, you know, the last two years I became the India trade guy. But uh, one of the best jobs I had at USTR was the environment ouster, um, which was fantastic. And much of the great stuff we were doing was in our free trade agreements on environment. I think TPP is a reflection, CPTPP is a reflection of you know really putting some some strong environmental standards um, commitments in a trade agreement. Um, you know it's it's a bit more complicated in, in labor. You know you know with WTO there there's been relevant work since the launch of the Doha round um, and in in a, a couple of different aspects and so. You know, I think more work in that area is going to be important, particularly in, in the climate change context and, you know, what what countries can do with their, you know, their cap and trade or their, um, you know, their their carbon tax systems to uh, deal with uh, exports from countries that don't aren't similarly combating climate change. I mean, that's a conversation. That's an issue that needs to be undertaken in the WTO. Labor is so much more complicated. Um, just because it, it's the it's the issue that you know nearly the entire developing country world, unless maybe it's changed, has basically said no way. You know we are not doing this work. We're not negotiating these issues uh, in the WTO. I think it's short sighted. It's unfortunate. Um, you know I was in Seattle when President Clinton was on his way to Seattle and said made a statement about doing labor in the WTO and everybody freaked out and it was one of the contributing factors to Seattle being the disaster it was. So, you know, I'm not arguing for labor issues not being in the WTO, but it's politically, it's really complicated. So I actually wrote a piece about labor um, in and trade. Um, and I, I, I think Mark's right. I think it's a no, it's a no hooper um, at the WTO. Um, there was interesting um, action, you know, obviously everyone's looking at the USMCA to see how the raf rapid um, response mechanism is going to work um, that could help to allay some fears. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing action um, uh, on potentially action on impulse from Xinjiang. Um, the Europeans are looking very well, Ignacio can say this, um, but my impression is that the Europeans are looking with interest at the US um, mechanism in their trade deals. But I think these things are going to have to proliferate in um, smaller agreements before they have a hope of becoming multilateral because um, to the developing countries, it just looks like um, it's a way to to shut them out. Um, yeah, well, I mean, this is exactly that, that could uh, take uh, us a whole new session on the Atlantic Council eh, because I we have so much, so much to say. Now, first, uh, as far as uh, environment is concerned, I'm convinced that you need to be able to do much more in the WTO on environment that has been done so far. Not in terms of rules negotiation, because perfectly the rules as they are, are quite adequate. And I think once you pay tribute to the upper body for having made a very constructive interpretation of, of the rules in terms of what you can do in order to protect the environment. So the issue is not one of negotiating the rules. The issue is much more how to enhance the role of the WTO in terms of 
policy deliberation in terms of a change of best practices. There would be an agreement uh, with Mark that wants to look, for instance, about how to revitalize the role of the Committee of Trade and Environment. And there's a lot of interest about many countries to do, uh, to do that. And also to identify areas where you can have win-win opportunities. We should be able to reactivate negotiations on tariffs and on services on products which are relevant for climate mitigation. So on environment, I think that in my view, clearly there should be an active agenda in the WTO to make uh, these issues much more present than they currently than they currently are. Labor, I agree, is something that is politically much more uh, sensitive, much more difficult uh, to bring to the WTO. But quite frankly, there should be no taboos, at least to say that these are topics which are worth discussing and worth deliberating about. Maybe it is just a question of cooperation between the WTO and the ILO. That was something that used to happen in the past, and for a number of reasons, hasn't been happening more, more recently. But again, there should be no taboos about discussing certain issues in the, in the, in the WTO. And of course, you need to look into the whole picture, with what you can do multilaterally, what you can do in your bilateral agreements, and what you can do autonomously. And in my view, it would be important to have a conversation on all of the three dimensions both on labor and on the environment. So I think as uh, Sumaya pointed out earlier, I'm an American and obviously I view this through the American political landscape. And one of the things that I think was, uh, one of the accomplishments I think this administration should be most proud of was its ability to forge a bipartisan consensus on the USMCA, the renegotiation of NAFTA. And part of the way that they did that was by introducing these issues in a very robust way into the trade agreement text in a way that had never been done before. And I think if we're being realistic and we're looking at the world right now and we're seeing this skepticism towards globalization and a lot of the developed world, you know, it is going to be politically imperative to introduce these kinds of concepts, whether it's climate change or whether it's a livable wage for workers, to introduce those concepts into our, our multilateral trade agreements. Uh, I think it's just essential for us to continue to support trade over time in somewhat the same way I would say that having the ability to enact trade remedies is also essential. Uh, that said, I, I clearly understand that some of these things will be difficult uh, for, for countries in the developing world. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I put out here, as someone called it earlier, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a U.S. slash EU wish list, but certainly there's going to be uh, flexibilities and concessions that we would have to make from the U.S. side as well. Um, you know, I've, I've given that some thought, but maybe I won't share all those now and get ahead of the negotiations. But I do think that this is going to be a compromise solution if we find a way to fix the WTO. But my point here is that I think labor and the environment in some way need to be part of that compromise if we are going to be able to do this politically and create a sustainable institution for the future. Um, but, you know, I guess I'm the last speaker, so I just want to conclude with where I started, which is by saying thank you to everyone uh, for listening. I hope you enjoy the paper. I hope you take it in the spirit in which it was offered, which was intended to be a starting point so we can think more ambitiously, so we can look at things comprehensively, and then hopefully we can start with the US and the EU working together build out from there and make sure that the WTO can remain um, at the center of the international trading system. So thank you. Thank you all. And my gratitude to Mark, Sumaya, Ignacio, and Cleet for a wonderful conversation. Um, this adds to the many transatlantic wish lists that we have at the Atlantic Council. So I'd like to just thank the audience also for active participation, for sticking with us. And I wish you all a lovely Friday and weekend. Bye bye.